A few weeks ago, we looked at the very earliest stages of civilization in the Near East, focusing on Mesopotamia and especially the Sumerian city-states in the southern portion of that region. We stopped that week at 2004 BC, with the Elamite destruction of the empire ruled by the third dynasty of Ur. This week, we'll look at the Near East in the second millennium BC, and see how cultures developed in the aftermath of that empire's collapse. One important development that you should notice right away is that southern Mesopotamia is not as prominent a region this week. As civilization spread and developed throughout the Near East, the advantage that early city-states had gave way to larger territorial states that had grown up on the fringes of Mesopotamia. We saw a couple weeks ago as well that Egypt was drawn into the affairs of the Near East in the latter half of the second millennium BC as new kingdom pharaohs sought to establish an Egyptian empire to prevent any future invasions of Egypt proper. Egypt thus plays a major role in the latter portion of this lecture. Before we look at the second millennium though, we should take some time to look at the development of civilization around Mesopotamia to set the stage for those cultures rise to prominence later. We've already looked a bit at civilizations to the east of Sumer, in what is now the border area between Iraq and Iran. The Elamite kingdom grew up there at the end of the 3rd millennium BC, and ultimately spelled the doom of the Ur-3 empire. Meanwhile, to the west of Mesopotamia lay the Levant, the region now occupied by Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and Jordan. In this region, small, independent city-states had arisen during the 3rd millennium, but the region was rather sparsely populated, and primarily tied to Old Kingdom Egypt, rather than Sumer. In northern Mesopotamia, Syria, and Anatolia, that is modern Turkey, new civilizations were also developing. Small city-states in Syria first fell under the influence of the Akkadian Empire, then the Ur-3 Empire, before asserting independence again around the start of the second millennium. But the Taurus Mountains that separate Anatolia from Syria proved an effective barrier in the third millennium, and wars of conquest do not seem to have crossed the mountains. Which is not to say that trade did not. Many valuable resources, such as silver, were available in Anatolia and in high demand in Sumer, so Sumerian traders were continuously crossing the mountains. By about 2500 BC, a series of small kingdoms had arisen in Anatolia due to this contact. The secondary states were ruled by trader kings who were probably locked in a constant competition to control trade routes and resources. Two of the most important of these small city-states were Alacha Huyuk, where a series of rich royal tombs have been excavated showing the wealth that could come from such trade, and Kanish, which in the first few centuries of the second millennium was the site of a trader's colony. The city of Kanish itself was occupied and ruled by native Anatolian peoples, but outside the city's defenses was a large settlement of clearly Mesopotamian people dispatched from the northern city of Asher to maintain trade relationships. The trader's colony preserved a large collection of cuneiform tablets recording correspondence between the colonists and their bosses in Asher. The documents reveal that this was only one of ten such settlements commissioned by the king of Asher and endorsed by local Anatolian leaders. So the long-distance trade that satisfied Mesopotamians' demand for resources, both practical and luxury, drove the development of secondary states in Anatolia in much the same way it did in the Indus Valley. When the Ur-3 Empire collapsed at the end of the third millennium, these Anatolian states were poised to take advantage of the vacuum it created. 2004 BC marks the beginning of a new phase of Mesopotamian history known as the Old Babylonian Period, which lasts until 1595 BC. During the first 200 years of this period, most of Mesopotamia was gripped by political chaos. The various city-states of the south fought among themselves for supremacy, with the position of highest prestige shifting hands frequently. In the north, Asher was on the rise as a regional power, but it could not establish any long-lasting stability. Our primary sources for understanding this period come from the royal archives at Mari, a northern city-state that was ultimately sacked and burned, the fires conveniently baking the clay tablets of the archives into ceramic and preserving them. 
The Mari documents reveal a northern Mesopotamia wrapped up in regional disputes, while southern Mesopotamia was embroiled in a game of shifting alliances between equally matched kings and those lesser kings they'd forced into their service. This pattern persisted for about 200 years until the reign of Hammurabi of Babylon. Babylon had, until now, been a relatively minor city in the middle part of Mesopotamia, just north of Akkad, in the vicinity of modern Baghdad. Hammurabi came to the throne in 1792 BC and set about consolidating Babylonian power throughout Mesopotamia. By the time of his death in 1750 BC, he had unified all of southern and middle Mesopotamia and conquered several cities farther north. This marks the beginning of the old Babylonian Empire. Hammurabi's strategy for imperial expansion was similar to the third dynasty of Ur. Rather than purely military, he also pursued diplomacy and economic ties, bringing some cities into his rule by peaceful means. Other cities, such as Mari, he sacked and burned. Within his domain, Hammurabi restructured land rights and economic power to make his conquered territories dependent on the crown and unable to rebel. He also reformed and centralized government in such a way as to tie the people together into a single unit. One part of this reform program was, apparently, a standardization of laws, harmonizing the very different legal systems of each of the incorporated territories. In fact, the most famous artifact of Hammurabi's reign is the legal code, which he published on stone stelae set up in public places. Today we know it through a single remaining example, which was recovered from Elam, where it was taken much later as a war trophy. The stela is made of diorite, a fine-grained black stone known for its durability. At the top is an image of Hammurabi receiving the laws from the god of justice, Shamash, and below are inscribed 282 laws. They depict a legal system very focused on class differences between nobles, commoners, and slaves, but one also interested in justice. The famous line, an eye for an eye, derives from the Hebrew Bible, but it has parallels in Hammurabi's code. While it's often taken as an authorization for harsh punishment, the context of class and continuous warfare in Mesopotamia suggests such laws are better understood as limitations, that is, take only an eye for an eye. Hammurabi's empire, like those that came before it, was relatively short-lived. Within a few generations, Babylonian rule throughout Mesopotamia was weakening to be finally crushed by another invasion from without, this time coming from the north and those Anatolian cultures who developed under Mesopotamian influence. In 1595 BC, the Hittites, the first major Anatolian state, swept southward across the Taurus Mountains. Under King Merciless I, they sacked Babylon. The old Babylonian Empire evaporated. The Hittites' rise to power in the Near East marks a watershed event. Political and military power shifted north and west out of lower Mesopotamia, more or less permanently. Now the dominant powers in the region were the secondary civilizations that grew up on the fringes of the Fertile Crescent, and those in the land between the rivers would play a peripheral role. In the latter half of the second millennium, southern Mesopotamia came to be ruled by a dynasty known as the Kassites. These were foreigners, speaking a language known as Kassite, who took control of Babylonia. Their major rivals in southern Mesopotamia were the Elamites, but these conflicts had little impact on the events taking place to the north and west. Those events were dominated by three major powers, Egypt, the Hittites, and Mitanni. We've already discussed Egyptian civilization in detail. Let's look next at the Hittites. The Hittite Empire is significant for its unique historical circumstances. Anatolia was an ethnically diverse patchwork of cultural traditions, divided by mountainous and arid terrain. Throughout their history, the Hittites were as concerned by relationships with their Anatolian neighbors as with the rest of the Near East. The Hittites, though attested to in Near Eastern historical documents and the Hebrew Bible, were for a long time thought to be a minor ethnic group by modern historians. It wasn't until the excavations of Hugo Winkler in 1906 that it became clear that they were a major force shaping the Near East. Winkler excavated the Hittite capital, Hattusis, or modern Bogoskoy, and discovered there the imperial archives. While the Hittites used a cuneiform writing system, they wrote in their own language, which turned out to be Indo-European, more closely related to Greek and Latin than to Akkadian or Egyptian. 
The archives showed that Hattusis had been the Hittite capital since about 1650 BC, and that by that time the Hittites were already a major power within Anatolia. At the start of the 16th century BC, they were poised to expand beyond Anatolia, and Merciless I's expedition into Babylonia was the first step of that campaign. Unfortunately for them, their ethnically diverse homeland prevented that. Soon after Merciless expedition, the Hittite kingdom broke apart in a protracted civil war. Rival Hittite noblemen, backed by various Anatolian ethnic groups jockeying for their own positions, fought one another for 150 years, during which another rival rose in northern Mesopotamia and consolidated power, Mitanni. The Mitanni kingdom is very poorly understood by modern archaeologists, overshadowed as it is by both earlier and later states in the same region. Ethnically and linguistically, the Mitanni leadership, and perhaps the people as well, were distinct from earlier Mesopotamian kingdoms. There are indications of ties to the north in Armenia and the Caucasus region, but their origin is ultimately a mystery for now. Between about 1550 BC and about 1300 BC, the Mitanni ruled much of what is now Syria, northern Iraq, and southeastern Turkey, and they sought to extend their control southward along the eastern end of the Mediterranean. This is where the Mitanni ran into their first major rivals in the area, New Kingdom Egypt. Following Ahmose's expulsion of the Hyksos kings about 1550 BC, 18th dynasty pharaohs created an Egyptian empire throughout the southern Levant, extending north to the southern edge of Mitanni rule. For several generations, the Egyptians and Mitanni fought one another for control of the Levant. Meanwhile, the Hittite civil war was coming to an end, and stability was returning to Anatolia. In the late 15th century, the Hittites began pressing southward into Mitanni territory. Recognizing that the Hittite expansion was a threat to both their interests, about 1400 BC the Egyptians and Mitanni settled the differences with a peace treaty and an alliance against the Hittites. The 14th century is the period of the later 18th dynasty in Egypt and the coming of age of the Hittites. We know quite a bit about this period thanks again to the discovery of another archive of cuneiform diplomatic papers. This time the clay tablets were discovered at the Egyptian city of Amarna, the capital of the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten. It's probably due to the swift abandonment of that capital that these documents were preserved. Today they're known as the Amarna letters, and they're primarily letters written from Egypt's tributary states in the Levant to Akhenaten. Recall that Akhenaten had overturned the Egyptian pantheon, placing his own deity on top and moving the capital to Amarna, all as a way of breaking the growing power of the temple priesthoods. This was apparently not just a cynical political move on his part. During his reign, he seems to have been remarkably disinterested in politics and remarkably focused on religion and the luxuries of royal life. The Amarna letters repeatedly begged the pharaoh to send support to his Levantine allies to help them defend against foreign encroachment. Kings of dependent city-states accuse one another of treachery and protest their own dedication and loyalty to Egypt. It seems like their pleas for help fell on deaf ears. There's no indication that Akhenaten did anything but provide token support for his empire. Later rulers like Tutankhamun and Horemheb may have responded, but it wasn't until the 19th dynasty that Egypt really turned its attention back to the Levant. Sometime not long before 1300 BC, the Hittite king Supeluliumus I succeeded in conquering Mitanni and taking most of its empire. The remaining territories would evolve into the Middle Assyrian Kingdom, about which we'll have more to say next week. Now the Hittites, a young and expanding empire, were face to face with the Egyptians, an old empire trying to hold on to its possessions. The rivalry came to a head at the Battle of Kadesh in 1279 BC where the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II faced off against Hittite king Mutawallis for control of the Near East. Both sides claimed victory in the battle, which we know of primarily from Ramses' heavily propagandistic accounts, but it's clear that what actually happened was a bloody stalemate. Not long after, in 1263 BC, both empires signed a formal peace treaty, dividing the Levant and neighboring regions between them. This left the Hittite Empire at its height, the point at which the Hittites ruled the greatest territory throughout the Near East and Anatolia.
It's also the point at which the capital Hattusis reached its most developed stage. In the 13th century BC, Hattusis had no fewer than two dozen monumental temples built out of massive stone blocks. The walls enclosed 180 hectares, and between 40 and 50,000 people lived there. Given the number of temples in the city, it should come as no surprise that Hittite kings appear to have been quite devout. The main religious center for the capital was not in the city itself, however, but two kilometers away at Yazili Kaya. This is a natural complex of deep canyons reaching back into the mountains, which the Hittites walled off to form open-air temple galleries. On the walls of the canyons, they carved intricate scenes of the gods and their kings. These images tied the gods, the government, and even nature itself into a single massive propagandistic statement of legitimacy, a, a legitimacy reinforced by the Hittites' recognition as an equal of Egypt. When the Hittite Empire reached its greatest extent, it controlled much of the Levant, Syria, and northern Mesopotamia, as well as most of Anatolia. As you recall, Anatolia was an ethnically diverse place that was always more troublesome for the Hittite kings than their foreign holdings. As the 13th century BC progressed, these Anatolian groups continued to rebel against their Hittite rulers, causing much unrest in the heartland of the empire. Some of the groups that are recorded as troublesome seem to be the early ancestors of groups that would later become important in Anatolian history. The most interesting of these was, as the Hittites called them, the Ahiyahua. The Ahiyahua lived on the far western coast of Anatolia and seem to have had a very sophisticated kingdom of their own. Scholars have equated the Ahiyahua with the Achaeans, the name that early Greek-speaking peoples had for themselves. Keep in mind that Heinrich Schliemann had proved the general historicity of early Greek legends of the Trojan War, which took place in northwestern Anatolia. The Greeks' Trojan enemies may have been tributaries of the Hittites, or at least close cultural relatives. We'll discuss the Greek cultures of this period more in a few weeks. The Hittite Empire, as powerful as it was in the 13th century, did not last long past 1200 BC. Around that time, Hattusis was evacuated of most of its population, and soon thereafter burned. At the same time, the Egyptian Empire in the southern Levant was being plagued by a series of seaborne invasions, and the Mycenaean Greeks on the other side of the Aegean were abandoning their own palaces and cities. This general upheaval, attributed to marauding sea peoples of uncertain origin, affected civilizations throughout the Mediterranean and marks yet another major shift in the civilizations in the region. What emerged out of the chaos a few hundred years later would be a map very different from the one before. Egypt, now in its late period, had lost its Levantine Empire and withdrawn into its own borders again. The Hittite Empire, in fact almost the entire Hittite culture, had vanished, falling apart into smaller kingdoms that would eventually become the kingdoms of the classic period of Anatolia. The towns of the Levant, who had been fought over for centuries by bigger neighbors, were newly independent but not for long. Next week, we'll see what happened in the Near East during the first millennium BC, a period often called the Iron Age. <laughs>